This globe shows the two main kinds of crust on the Earth, oceanic and continental. The oceanic rock is denser, but the continental crust is thicker, and so it stands higher, sticking out from the sea. Where it is submerged as continental shelf, we get shallower seas. Both kinds of crust can be stable or mobile, and in the mobile areas, mountain building, volcanoes, and earthquakes occur. The mobile areas tend to be around plate boundaries. The Earth's crust consists of solid plates, floating like rafts on the molten rocks of the Earth's interior and drifting under the influence of its thermal activity. Their relative motions have caused great collisions in some areas, building giant mountain chains such as the Himalayas. Elsewhere, plates drift apart, grind past each other, or actually sink one under the other, often causing earthquakes and volcanoes.
Mount Pinatubo, a volcano in the Philippines, exploded on the 15th of June, 1991. These satellite images show an area 1,200 miles across. The volcano is the source of a steady plume of material from midnight GMT with prevailing winds from the east. At 8 a.m., the main eruption starts, producing circular shock waves as material punches through the clouds above, rising to a height of 25 miles. By 6 p.m., the dust cloud stretched over 500 miles across the sea to the coast of Asia. This globe shows the movement of the continents over 600 million years. You can see how the land masses that we're familiar with today have changed and moved over the millennia. Notice how Africa and South America used to fit together. You can also see that mountain ranges tend to form where continental plates collide. Look for the collisions that caused the rise of the Himalayas and the Alps.
By combining two satellite image globes, one by day and one by night, we can see how the rotation of the Earth about its axis and around the Sun changes the patterns of day and night over the year. Notice the North Pole is dark from September to March, while the South Pole remains light. From space, the Earth looks like a deep blue disk, because the deep blue sea covers 71% of the planet's surface. But what appears flat from afar reveals a dramatic landscape under the surface. Steep undersea canyons and deep trenches like the Mariana Trench in the Pacific, the deepest point in the ocean anywhere in the world, nearly 36,000 feet. That's deeper than the highest mountain on Earth is high. Mount Everest, which rises 29,000 feet above the border of Nepal and China. Everest is part of the Himalayan range, which has more than 30 mountains rising at least 24,000 feet. Kilimanjaro, at 19,000 feet, is part of a much smaller range, but is the highest peak in Africa. Africa does have the longest river in the world, the Nile, stretching for 4,145 miles. Only slightly shorter is the Amazon in South America, which actually carries more water than any other river on Earth. The Colorado River is known not for its length or volume, but for the creation of its current, the Grand Canyon, an abyss more than a mile deep. When it comes to uninterrupted vertical drop, the water flowing over Ribbon Falls in California's Yosemite National Park falls the furthest in North America, more than 1,600 feet. Each color on this globe represents a distinct combination of climate, terrain, and vegetation, called a biome. The four aquatic and nine terrestrial categories on this globe show a simplified model of our planet's biomes. Unlike the distinct borders shared by countries, boundaries between adjacent biomes are more like transition zones, containing a mixture of elements from both sides. To make matters more complex, each biome can contain several secondary or sub-biomes, each characterized by an even more specific combination of microclimate, topography, and plants. You can identify specific biomes from the desert to the rainforest. Double-click on the biome icons for more details.
Islands can be formed in several ways. The Florida Keys were formed by living coral reefs and limestone deposits formed on the underlying continental shelf. The geography of the islands is quite different from that of the adjacent continent. Generally, as an island's size decreases, so does the complexity of its climate, vegetation, terrain, and animal species, and the more fragile its web of life becomes. When humans transform island landscapes, the risk of permanent environmental damage is significant. Over two and a half million tourists visit the Florida Keys each year, mostly traveling from mainland Florida via the 114 miles of roadways and bridges that connect the Keys to the continent. Many of these tourists come to snorkel, fish, or boat near Florida's unique coral reefs. With careful use of recreation areas, the reef's long-term survival can be protected. Major urban settlements have been built on lands ranging from marshlands to deserts, to the geologically unstable areas near fault lines. Land has even been reclaimed from coastal waters in large development projects throughout history. Low-lying landscapes are magnets for many kinds of natural and human-generated geographic transformations. If these areas occur in a wet climate, the lack of hills or valleys for directing rainfall runoff creates an environment prone to flooding. When an easily dissolved material like limestone underlies a flat area, underground water can create holes that cause the surface above to collapse, forming groups of small, roundish lakes. The drowned forests and grasslands that have become swamps and marshes form in flat areas where there is no outlet for ground, river, or rainwater. Humans are drawn to the ease of building on naturally level landscapes, even when it means having to drain fragile wetland habitats. Each color on this globe represents a distinct combination of climate, terrain, and vegetation, called a biome. The four aquatic, low-lying landscapes
Unlike the permanent blue line that you see on a map, a river rarely stays the same over time. Rivers widen and narrow, twist and turn, and sometimes take entirely new courses. Given enough time, they can create new canyons, valleys, floodplains, deltas, estuaries, or lakes. Unlike the relatively straight rivers flowing through canyons or gorges, oxbow rivers flow in a series of exaggerated curves. These curves are formed when the water on the outside of the curve flows faster than the water on the inside, eroding the outside bank more quickly, creating complex intersections. When this happens, the river can break through the adjacent banks, bypassing the curve altogether. The old curve, now isolated from the river, is called an oxbow lake. The immense power of rivers is not underestimated by humans. Dams can generate huge amounts of electricity by restricting the water flow and harnessing its force. Though the benefits of hydroelectric power are many, dams can flood hundreds or thousands of square kilometers, displacing both human and animal residents, and can also interfere with the spawning and migration of fish like salmon and steelhead trout. Careful planning and communication can help minimize a dam's impact on the local environment and its inhabitants. Planet Earth is a wet and salty place. Oceans cover 127 million square miles, 71% of the Earth's surface. They contain 97% of all the water on the globe. Because water doesn't heat up or cool down as fast as land, the Earth's vast oceans have a moderating influence on atmospheric temperatures, making many areas on land more habitable than they would otherwise be. Seawater itself is highly habitable containing much more than just water and common salt or sodium chloride. It has a number of dissolved minerals, including calcium, sulfur, magnesium, and potassium. That special blend is part of a complex environment that sustains a staggering variety of plants and animals, much more diverse than on land, and found from the surface all the way down to depths of 10,000 feet and even deeper. In fact, new forms of oceanic life continue to be discovered, particularly in the dramatic depths along the mid-ocean trenches. But the richness of the oceanic biosphere is being threatened by mankind, not just from giant oil spills, but from overfishing and air pollution, from agricultural and industrial runoff, and from the waste generated by growing urban populations. By the year 2000, a billion people worldwide will live in cities by the sea. Still, some progress has been made. In recent years, fishing restrictions, including the banning of giant drift nets and ocean dumping rules have helped. But the protection of the ocean, as perhaps mankind's ultimate food source, is far from assured.
The land that meets the sea is known as the coast. Depending on the local climate, land and water features, the appearance of a coast can change markedly. Coasts can be bisected by river estuaries and deltas, fragmented into islands, fringed with beaches, bordered by cliffs, protected by coral reefs, lagoons or barrier islands, framed by marshes and swamps, or shaped into bays, inlets and harbors. Deltas are usually formed at the mouth of a river. When the river enters the sea, it slows down and drops its suspended sediments and create a characteristic fan shape, extending the river mouth past the original coastline. Sometimes the river splits into channels, slicing the delta into a series of coastal islands. The saying, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it, isn't exactly true. Satellite imagery and computer modeling have significantly advanced weather forecasting. Talk about the weather and you're talking about short-term conditions in the troposphere, the region of the Earth's atmosphere closest to the surface. Temperature, humidity, wind, precipitation, pressure and cloudiness are the basic elements that interact to create the weather. Everything from the high clouds and rising pressure of a pleasant day to the high winds and rain of an intense circular center of low pressure called a tropical cyclone or a hurricane when it affects North or Central America. Weather over long-term periods is called climate. Climate is dramatically influenced by latitude, the distance from the equator. That's because the Earth's axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees from the vertical. That tilt the Earth's rotation on its axis and its 365-day revolution around the Sun result in the seasons, the Sun's rays hitting different parts of the globe in varying strengths throughout the year. This globe shows how the changing seasons affect Earth's vegetation. The Earth spins on a tilted axis as it orbits the Sun. This means that the Northern Hemisphere points toward the Sun during the Northern Summer and away from the Sun during the Northern Winter. South of the equator, this pattern is reversed. It's summer in New Zealand when it's winter in Mongolia. In the summer, days are longer and warmer than in winter and plant growth becomes accelerated. You can actually see the northern hemisphere get greener between April and September, which is the northern summer. During the same months, you can watch the southern winter cause the Antarctic ice sheet to grow.
rain, snow, and other forms of water reaching the earth from the atmosphere are known as precipitation. The amount of precipitation is influenced by many factors, including temperature, wind, and the location of mountains and oceans. Coastal areas experience heavy precipitation when rain-bearing clouds get blown in from the oceans. The hot, dry deserts experience little precipitation because mountain barriers, altitude or distance from water, limit cloud activity. Surprisingly, the polar wastes can also be classified as deserts. They're too cold to permit the formation of any precipitation, and so, despite vast quantities of ice, are some of the driest places on Earth. The arrows on this globe show the direction and strength of Earth's major winds. Some of these winds are powerful enough to affect world climate. Midway between the equator and the poles, powerful trade winds blow from west to east to cross the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. These winds are so strong that they often drag whole storms along with them. At the equator, weak winds blow from east to west, doing little to change a climate that is often oppressively hot and still. Strong seasonal changes in strength and direction are most noticeable along the continental coasts, which is why many migrating birds choose coastal routes. One of the most dramatic changes is the north-south switch in the direction of air blowing around the Himalayas. This change signals the start of the monsoon season. In the southern hemisphere, particularly circling the coast of Antarctica, winds are stronger because there are fewer continental land masses to stand in their way.
This globe shows how average temperatures around the world change over the year. The biggest seasonal differences occur in the temperate or mid-latitudes. Watch the red areas, indicating the hottest temperatures, move north and then south in step with summer in the northern and southern hemispheres. Notice how the surrounding areas change to yellow and then blue, indicating cooler temperatures closer to the poles. Temperatures over the oceans change less than those over the land, because water takes longer than air to both heat and cool. This phenomenon has a stabilizing influence on coastal areas, which experience less temperature variation than interior areas. Many animals, including humans, migrate in time with these seasonal changes in search of both food and warmth. Temperatures at the Earth's surface can change a great deal over the course of a single day. Some of the biggest differences occur in deserts, particularly those of Central Asia and North Africa. Deserts usually lack the clouds that form a barrier to the sun's harsh rays during the day and seal in warmth at night. The opposite is true in cloudy, rainy equatorial areas, like the Amazon, where temperatures change little between night and day. Smaller 24-hour changes are also found in coastal areas and islands due to the stable temperatures of the nearby oceans. This is true even for large islands like Madagascar. Ocean currents often follow the same patterns as global winds, especially near the surface. The biggest difference is that continents completely block the flow of the water between oceans, giving rise to very strong currents along their coasts. This is most obvious along the east coasts of Asia and North America. In the western Atlantic Ocean, strong arrows show the Gulf Stream bringing warm water from the Gulf of Mexico to northern Europe. This is why countries like the United Kingdom can have warmer climates and larger populations than areas closer to the equator, such as Canada's southeast coast. Below the surface, strong currents bring cold waters from the poles to the equator. For example, the Humboldt Current brings chilly Antarctic waters up the west coast of South America, allowing penguins to live off the coast of Peru.
Ozone in the upper atmosphere forms a protective layer around the Earth, shielding the surface from damaging ultraviolet rays. Ozone levels vary with weather patterns and season, but a trend to lower levels has been detected over the South Pole in recent years. Here, you can see the hole in the ozone layer that forms each spring. When we show chlorine monoxide as a green cloud, it lines up with the hole in the ozone. This largely derives from man-made compounds called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. They build up over the dark winter months, causing the rapid loss of ozone in the spring when the sun returns. Ozone is a type of oxygen formed in the upper atmosphere that helps block harmful radiation from the sun. In this animation based on satellite data, the ozone can be seen forming a protective layer around the globe. But over Antarctica, a huge ozone hole develops each spring. The protective layer is being destroyed. Here's the culprit. Green shows reactive chlorine that attacks the ozone when sunlight hits the polar air in the spring. The chlorine comes from a range of useful compounds called CFCs, used widely for refrigeration and industrial processes. When old refrigerators are trashed, the CFCs escape into the atmosphere. With less protective ozone, more harmful radiation gets through. Too much sun, particularly around noon, can lead to skin cancer. Everyone needs to be careful about sunbathing, particularly those with fair skin. Happily, there is some good news. In 1990, most of the world's governments agreed to phase out CFCs.
This animation shows the effects that a rise of 25 meters in sea level would have on an area of northern Germany. This is an extreme projection, which would only happen if most of the land ice in Antarctica melted, which would take several hundred years. However, a rise of 1 to 2 meters is possible with a global temperature rise of 5 to 10 degrees centigrade. Today, we're experiencing the greatest loss of species since life began. We could be losing several dozen species every day, far faster than when the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. There is a real danger that our grandchildren could live in a world where tigers, rhinos, and the California condor are only memories left on video. The reasons are habitat destruction, population growth, and sheer greed as demand for products from endangered species continues. Setting aside protected areas has saved some species, but this only works if local people can earn a living from the reserves rather than poaching. Otherwise, national parks may only exist on paper. There's nothing new about habitat destruction. Early U.S. settlers spread out across the prairies and plowed too deep. The soil blew away, leaving the dust bowls of the 30s. Today, the problem isn't just plowing. From space, you can see fires burning across the Amazon. They're started by landless peasants clearing land to make a living in the forest. They're often joined by loggers, and finally, cattle ranchers creating temporary grazing land for livestock. The richest habitat on Earth could be gone in under 40 years. 
The government is aware of the problem, but the profits help pay off international debts. Some creditor nations, meanwhile, are writing off these debts. But it may be too little, too late. Habitat destruction, however, is not limited to the world's tropical forests. Take a look for yourself. Every second, two babies are born. By the year 2000, there'll be six billion of us, five times as many as there were in 1900. Child death rates have fallen almost everywhere, and many people want large families, as their children may be their only security in old age. Overpopulation is only a problem when people have insufficient access to resources like clean water, food, and housing. So no matter how good the ads for contraception, the most successful population programs work at improving people's living standards and education. Overpopulation is worse than the world's ever-expanding urban areas. At night, satellites pick out our major cities. By the century's end, eight of the world's ten largest conurbations will be in developing nations.
At night, lights visible from space show off population centers around the world, as well as some of mankind's more illuminating activities. See if you can identify the cities of Europe, America, and Asia, or spot the flares generated by burning gas and oil wells in Siberia and the Middle East. Other light sources to look for include bushfires in Africa, burning rainforests in South America, and the spotlights of fishing boats in the Sea of Japan. popular saying here on Earth is, just throw it in the trash. In the United States, homes and businesses produce more than 200 million tons of solid waste every year, enough to fill a convoy of trucks halfway to the moon. More than a third of all that garbage is paper, nearly a fifth yard trimmings. The other top trash, metals, plastic, glass, and food waste. In recent years, the idea of sustainability has taken hold. Sustainability means creating less trash and reusing more of it. Recycling is one way to reuse waste, including recycling of newspapers for making other paper products, and reprocessing of plastic bottles for insulation in jackets. Composting is a way to reuse yard waste, like leaves and grass clippings. It's a method for speeding up nature's own way of breaking down dead plants. A compost heap in the yard turns waste into excellent fertilizer. Composting and recycling are just two steps towards sustainability. Another is producing less waste in the first place by being more careful about what we buy, use, and throw away. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has set a national goal of reducing and recycling our waste by 25%. Here you can see the reduction of the size of the Aral Sea over 20 years, caused by diverting the rivers that feed it for irrigation.
Here you can see the reduction of the size of the Aral Sea over 20 years, caused by diverting the rivers that feed it for irrigation. In this image of Bombay, supplied by NASA and taken during a recent space shuttle flight, you can see the city once known as the Gateway of India. The distinctive peninsula location of Bombay, which is predicted to have the fifth largest population in the world by the year 2000, was once the headquarters of the East India Company. You can see that its sheltered bays made it an ideal trading center. This view of London was created from Russian spy satellite data, with color provided by the SPOT satellite. Zoom in to pick out Buckingham Palace in its gardens, Hyde Park and the Serpentine, Tower Bridge, and, south of the Thames, the Oval Cricket Ground. What other landmarks can you find? In this photograph of Moscow, taken from the space shuttle, you can clearly make out the river Moskva flowing through Russia's capital. The Kremlin, in the heart of the city, was the administrative center for the Soviet Union. It is situated north of the central bend of the river. To the southwest of the Kremlin, you can just make out Gorky Park. In this photograph of Moscow, here you can see the organized grid street patterns of Manhattan Island and New York. Central Park is clearly visible in its midst, but can you pick out Liberty and Governor's Islands off its shores in the Hudson River, or LaGuardia Airport to the east?
Here you can look at the famous West Coast city from every angle. Starting from a bird's eye view, descend to the horizon and zoom in and out to locate the Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz Prison, and the hills of Marin County. At present, Tokyo is the largest city in the world, although it's likely to be overtaken by Mexico and Sao Paulo by the year 2000. This picture, taken by astronauts from the space shuttle, shows the huge expanse of the eastern metropolis. The several rivers that feed the port are clearly visible, and if you zoom in, you can make out Tokyo Haneda International Airport south of the harbor mouth, and the gardens of the Imperial Palace, almost the only bit of green to the east. Here you can see the organized grid street patterns of Manhattan Island and New York. Welcome to Around the World, the global trivia challenge that tests your knowledge of flags, facts, and photos from every corner of the planet. Answer questions and rack up travel miles to advance. First one to circumnavigate the globe wins.
Oops. Oops. Thank you. 
Oops. Antarctica. <laughs> 